There we go. So about let's talk about delusion here. So we we, we come to this agreement. Delusion or delusion? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, great. Yeah, it was. I mean, I thought it So, we come to this consensus of value. Now we have to look at okay, you've made a lot of promises to a lot of people. Let's look at we look at their cap table. We would say you've already made a lot of promises, you've issued this amount of equity for this amount of money, so what is my investment worth? So you would, in the way that this works now, if there were charts, would be we would look at supply versus available supply. And we would say, okay, I'm buying in and everything's taken, so what I'm getting is an accurate representation. My portion of this total market cap of this value of this company is accurate. Whereas if you look at um, you know, as an angel investor, you would look at it as, okay, now, you know, there's all of this margin between what I'm getting and what is going to be given out still, so my value is going to get diluted. And that's what we see if there's a, a lot of supply still left. We can buy our portion of the current market cap, but it can still be diluted. And so in, in the startup world, you would look at a, a market cap what you want to see is a reserved pool of equity that is only going towards investors so that you know anytime they want to acquire more capital they don't have to dilute everybody's shares and yeah the the, the practical application and for us if there were charts would be the um looking at the available supply makes sense yeah. so your true value as an angel is the number of tokens that you own versus the eventual final supply number, or is a factor. Yeah, it's it's like how how much can my investment get diluted? diluted. Trying to bring it around to looking at supply versus available supply in this in this context. But your tokens. true ownership of the company is really, and the true value is based on the full supply, right? Well, yeah. let's say the full value of the company is based on the full supply, whether it's been issued or not. That's how you have to look at it. Okay. That's that's that's, that's the safe way. That's the I may own sixteen percent right now, but that I know that once everything gets, you know, you you think you need this amount of money, and you're going to dilute my shares. Maybe you don't have to dilute. Maybe you start earning money hands over feet. You don't have to take more money. I mean, the cool thing about it, right, is that the. For most of these white papers, they say what the final supply number is going to be, so you at least know what the final dilution yeah. is, and it doesn't change like in the VC. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's 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 very transparent. This, and that's a yeah. that's a that's a selling point to the to yeah, the ICO cool. yeah, um, really cool. way of raising funds is that it that is transparent, so you can see that. But yeah, when you're looking at ICO, look what the total supply is, and if they're not hard set on a supply, if they can just print tender anytime they want, then um, fiat. Yeah, right. right. Then then that's fiat. Yeah. So the analogy here would be something uh, in like a stock market where we have stock splits, and so you don't know necessarily if your dilution is going to be fixed or not in the future, right? So um, here, I guess you might be safer in that sense if there is some fixed cap that's promised to yeah. people. Yeah. But so then, I guess you're also referring to that if there's enough um, capital reserve to actually grow the the project itself, right? Because if it's, well, we're going to just airdrop everything to everybody, well, then how do you maintain your uh, right. revenue? Right. You don't maintain that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that comes back a lot to looking at the people that you're trusting and knowing who you're trusting with your money to know if they're going to be wise stewards of what capital they do have. And getting a sense of can they actually accomplish what they're trying to do with the expected value right. that they're going to generate. Yeah. And this is a problem I have with a lot of the, the, the decentralized computational services is it's such a monumental task to take over and to think that you're going to compete with an Amazon and IBM and you know we're still at a place where IBM's just getting there and now they're crushing it but it took them a long time to get there and to offer these consumer facing compute services and you know you're stepping up against some really big players so you know it's not overestimating so um, so let's look, let's get into the types of tokens real quick, and this this will be where there'll be a lot of debate. Of, you know, utility versus security. 
It's so gray, and you know the ICOs are really preying on this gray area. Um, in that, you know, they say that this token is offering access to our services which makes it utility. Nobody's buying it because if you want access, you're buying it because you think it's being worth more money. And you know the SEC sees right through that. So there's gonna be a lot of, um, you know, a lot of um, debate around that. Do you, you guys gonna have thoughts on this? Anybody always have thoughts on this? No, gosh, guys are ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> no, was it, no. Was that the cue for pulling the audience? Yeah, I, I, well, I know, I've talked to a few people, I know you have things. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 Maybe we're all just tired of talking about it. Like, yeah. yeah. I think it would be really neat to see some ICOs actually play by the SEC rules and say what it is possible to to be in compliance and still do an ICO and still be you know profitable or however they kind of what to, to evaluate their they're truly truly doing it like an IPO to raise capital. Like if it's yeah, I, I think that I think what's I think, thing, you know? I, I think what's going to be really cool now is uh, Wyoming and Delaware and who else? But now you can add shareholders. They 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 make it acceptable to you know log shareholders on a distributed ledger, which makes it more you know it's, if you have to go through the regular means of like the, um, documenting your shareholders, that takes away a lot of the luster of what you're doing. But if you can document your shareholders via a distributed ledger, then it makes it a lot more, um, a lot more chic, a lot more um, in line with your objectives. So I think we don't see this very much now, but the the interest dividends side of tokens, that'll be I think we'll see that come about a lot more. Where now it becomes this, it becomes way more relevant to this conversation now, where we're looking at companies as startups, like how much, you know, what's what are your like project like what what are your customers worth and how much revenue you're going to generate? Because that will be what affects how much money you make from those interest and dividends, not just what's the arbitrary price of this token based on all kinds of charts and whale manipulation and all kinds of arbitrary bullshit. Like it's going to be more. This is a valuable company that does valuable things that serves a customer and they are. I'm getting 10% of my investment back every year and. The infrastructure is there um, to start to do that now this year. Yeah, I think that's absolutely what, what needs to evolve out of this right now. We're in pure speculations, right? So we, once we can tie to, yes, it has some value that's appreciating over time, it's predictable, then stabilization is inevitable. Right? And bigger players get much more interested when they can play with the numbers that actually are existent, not just made up. And this is where we come back to. We were talking a long time ago, Venezuela needing to be stable. And when we get to this model more, we can have more stability. Um, your your revenue projections aren't just going to drop off overnight. So I can I can hold this currency because the you know the, it's earning value every day, and it's not just going to stop earning value overnight. I'm going to go buy another loaf of bread tomorrow because first is not. I think one of the issues that is totally relevant to this is the problem of transferability of, of security tokens. Um, so the status quo at the moment, we're not really sure which tokens are securities and which are utility. I would, I would argue, by the way, these are my own views. Um, I would argue that probably all ICOs are likely securities, but not all tokens, right? Because then you have to, the analysis gets a lot deeper whenever you're talking about, well, am I, am I passive? Am I giving money with a passive expectation of profit, right? Certainly, when you're talking about interest and dividends, that puts you pretty firmly in securities territory, yeah. right? You don't have to do anything to earn them, you just hold them. But it, it, let's take Starbucks, for instance. If, you, if Starbucks were to ICO, you know, in that unique circumstance, it might be neither, uh, it might not be a security at the ICO phase, and it might not be a security, certainly probably wouldn't be a security once it's utilized, because everyone already knows Starbucks. So, functional equivalent of a pre-existing platform with ready-made customer base that doesn't, you're not purchasing for investment purposes exactly. And they're just using a new technology right, to measure what they're doing. That's a one-to-one -one with what you need. I mean, you're definitely gonna use that to buy coffee or something, right? So um, we're, nothing in the space resembles that at the moment, in my estimation. Yeah. If someone knows of something that does, I'd love to hear it. I, I'd like to add to that, because like, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong in this viewpoint, because 
I really want to understand this better. If we look at the traditional venture capital fundraising for a company, you go and get money in an, in an IPO for money to be given to the company in exchange for a share of the company that is building all the product and generating all the revenue from whatever it is they're producing. Use Ripple as the boundary condition. Ripple's issuing currency to fund their development of a private infrastructure that we don't own by owning the token. Right. There is no connection between, right. my understanding, no connection between the two. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, that feels a bit like a scam. I'm, I'm giving money, I think there's a lot of people that think they're giving money to a utility token that's gonna have value by the network that they're building out. But the network they're building out is a part of the private company that does, that they have zero ownership in. And they are buying into a token that really has nobody using it. Ripple's pretty much why this slide even has to exist. The fact that I have to draw a line between value of a company versus value of a token. Ripple there, is what blows that out of the water. It's like, like you're a majority, valuable company. I, well, this is where I'd like to be corrected. Are a majority of the ICOs in that, in more in that camp? Or, or are they 100% in that camp? I don't think it's fair to say majority of the ICOs, given the majority of the ICOs are not doing anything at all, so we don't have anything to do. But I mean, if we buy that. Litecoin, are we owning the organ? Are we getting a piece of the organization that's responsible for its building and maintenance? Litecoin would be a different kind of example, given how old they are. And, okay. Um, well, I the, 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 I know it's not owned. It's not. It's not a corporation like Ripple is. Ripple's a corporation that is, you know. Um, but, but I, an organization I, I, yeah, could still have value, um, right? The organization behind Litecoin could still have value because they have resources that are organized to produce infrastructure. Yeah, well, I mean, the easiest parallel to draw would obviously be Stellar to say, mm -hmm. um, you know, XLM is native and to participate in, in Stellar's network, you would have to transact with Lumens at some point versus to use Ripple's protocol, you don't have to hold XRP at any point, so. But like could Stellar, the organization say, all right, we've uh, issued and all of our coins are in there. We're gonna now start our own cryptocurrency with the same people over here and create a whole new infrastructure using those people and just walk away from that? Well, they did. And, and like when, Stellar, with Stellar. When they were Ripple and then became Stellar. Okay, and that's so then that yeah. says that the, the people that own that token are not being represented in ownership of the organization that's responsible yeah. for its maintenance, building, and everything else. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's just this, it, it seems like in the crypto world, my understanding is it may not be completely disconnected right now, but the boundary condition is possible. Like yeah. they could just totally be separate and say, we're going to create another one. And we're really good at that. So the organization intact, 500 employees were building this one and doing it. Now they're going to build a brand new one. And they're going to sell it, and they're going to issue coins, and, and they're going to make you know millions again. And so know them. I mean, know the people, know what they're doing. Like, watch their like. Is is their mission legit? Are they really doing it? Are they putting foot in front of foot every day, or are they just trying to turn and burn? You know, figure out who they are as an organization. And you know, I I, I have a lot of faith. I I think in Stella, and I think that they will stick around and do what they aim to do. Thank the unbanked, and um, you know, Ripple wants to bank the bank and Stellar wants to bank the unbanked. And they're using what is essentially the same mechanism. So they've changed the, the consensus protocol bit like, you know, I mean, they just, it was a philosophical change. And, you know, from day to day, I mean, you know, they've become a fairly large organization to just peel off and become a new organization overnight is difficult for an organization like that. Um, organization that we don't know but anything it could. about. I mean, it, it could, could happen, right? Yeah, but there becomes this accountability when you become public facing and large enough. You have a community, you have people that are invested in your mission, and you rely on those people to carry out your mission, those developers, those project managers, those product owners. Like, you rely on all of them, and you just say, hey guys, all those people where you're trying to help, fuck them, let's go make money. Like, you can't just pivot your organization like that once you become transparent enough. Well, power and, corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, sure, and if you're I mean, if, if you're invested, yeah, if you're invested in that organization, you're seeing these culture shifts, right? Like if they're transparent, and that's why a lot of ICOs are not transparent. Like they are, you know, somewhere else far away. Isn't it we see a case for regulation? So it's no different from a pump and dump scam. Uh, 
in the mid nineties. That's the case with self regulation. Well, 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 right now they're offering it without really but, having but, the base. But there's no there's no legal repercussion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so building off that idea, yeah, I mean, you, you can't say, hey, I'm going to take $100 million from people and then say, screw you, I'm going to start this other company and expect that you're going to get another $100 million and then be able to do it again and expect to get another $100 million. I mean, yeah, just but there'll be enough money. dumb money. That, I mean, well, I'll, I'll say, there'll be enough dumb money that will say, hey, they did it once, they're going to at least create some point, wealth. You know, like we were talking about with the dot-com bubble. I mean, you, you put dot-com at the end of your company's name in 1999 and you were going to get rich. It didn't matter what you were doing. Uh, but today, consumers are much more conscious of, of those kinds of efforts. But building off of this discussion, uh, this is another great way that you can differentiate between currencies and utility tokens. You know, if, if you can sue it, it's a utility token, it's an organization. <laughs> if you can't, it's a currency. Uh, you, you can't sue Bitcoin, you can't sue Litecoin or Vertcoin. Uh, you know, because it's not a central organization that controls the flow of that, whereas uh, an organization such as Stellar or Ripple or, or Walton or, or any number of these like EOS or Neo or are, it, are ones that have Coinbase organizations is, is that Coinbase you can. A can that be sued? Coinbase? Yeah, but Coinbase doesn't have a crypto token that they're offering. They're just an intermediary for people to buy tokens with fiat. But yeah, I mean, so if if it's a crypto token, but has an organization that can be sued as a legal entity, then that's a utility token. If it can't, then it's a currency. Yeah, yeah, that's a great delineation. Great way to look at it. But so you could still, I mean, you could still have a failed entity, right? So in, is your, in that, in that definition. Utility yeah, I mean, or security. Is anybody playing utility and security? Who has a coin out there that you would classify as both? There's a couple that are doing that well, we are going through project. regulatory we have a project, and we're, we're thinking about doing both utility and security. Is Neo is Neo one of those? It, By yeah. having the gas and and the dividends and depends on the jurisdiction. Yeah, Neo. I mean, it or, or even Ethereum. People can use it to buy and sell things if they choose to do so, but it's clearly a platform for yeah. decentralized apps. Which yeah. yeah. the, the mm -hmm. platform effect. Why? Well, yeah, this is very great. Is a lot of our kind of both, and since they haven't taken shape to be what they are going to be, they're in this interme intermediary phase, mm -hmm. it's hard to say. That's why the SEC has a hard time, you know, really locking it down. Mm -hmm. If they can be sued, does that say that that by owning the token, we own a portion of them, or a, po a portion of their Liability. serviceable value, or... No, yeah, no, actually, no. that's another measure, right? Not at if all. If you own a public reality, company, right? so essentially, not, you there there is that side of liability. Yeah, that's right why it would there. be distinct from a security because you're not holding ownership of an organization. You simply hold a certain amount of a fixed supply of a token that is used to transact in goods and services. But you know, I, I can't, you know. But do we own a part of that ten percent of the supply of Neo and, and you say I own ten percent of Neo's organization? No, I, I don't own any. But there will be ones that come about that will make that claim. Is you know if you make you will own whatever percentage of the market cap that you own, and that's and you have voting rights within there. Your vote weighs that amount of what you own. And yeah. right. it's, uh, it's, I don't it's see that model. It's anywhere. interesting how quickly in this conversation. We're quickly trying to divine a regulatory system yeah, exactly. in what we started off talking about as a decentralized <laughs> way of one, Isn't that beautiful that we want to that we are going there to self-regulate? Isn't isn't that I mean, a little bit political, isn't that the American mm -hmm. ideals is that we self-regulate, that we are free and that's what we do? And I mean I, I like that we're trying I like to the ideal. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't right. seen it executed very well very I mean, often, but Companies and individuals should never be too big to fail. It doesn't matter if you're a person or, or a behemoth banking institution. There shouldn't be anyone else on the hook for your bad decisions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the boundary condition that I like is where we have a lot of these blockchains that are all interoperable and that they all can thrive and we can all live in the nirvana that you painted at the beginning, which is we don't have to look at a pie that we're slicing up amongst us, that we can actually grow the pie as big as we all want. And that it's all kind of possible yeah, and interchangeable. If you become a piece of shit, then next we'll move on. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah, we'll figure out the and next. And not not one platform that can be too big to fail to that right. point, right? 
you know, if Bitcoin really was the only platform that we could exchange, then I'll go back to the absolute power thing. Even though, it, even if it's not people, it still has that ability to have. If it fails, then we're all done for. Yeah, yeah. can't be that. Uh, you guys feel good moving on from the. Oh, let's talk about liquidity. Liquidity is really important. Um, we haven't talked too much about decentralized exchanges, and you know that's a, that's that's the big shift that's happening now too, where you know all of these it is too big to fail notion of you know we depend so much on a pretty small pool of big exchanges, and these exchanges have the reserves to be able to facilitate these transactions. But you know I mean we see the influence that they have. I think probably the best example would be um, you know uh, South Korea. Um, with um, uh, Bitthumb in, when was this? Uh, it, it was, yeah, so, I think it was later than that. I think it might have been early January, January. where simply, you know, uh, coin market cap realized, well, money goes into Bitthumb, it can't come out, so we really should include that exchange, and they remove it, and our market crashes, because the numbers dropped on all the reporting mechanisms that we have, Value didn't change. They just removed one exchange from their reporting. And so then once it dropped, everybody's like, market's crashing, everybody sell. And that, I mean, that's probably the catalyst that led us to where we are now, down 30 some percent from November, where everybody freaked out. And so, so much power in an exchange is dangerous. And that wasn't even an exchange. So, what was in their that? interest to do that? Why was it? I mean, some, did they just think it was a great idea? The, the price disparity between. The yeah between prices on that exchange were so much higher. It's like three thousand dollars higher. It was insane. It's crazy. So, so I, I I noticed this as it was happening. I was like, yeah man, this price is high. I'm gonna go sell this on Binance. Like oh I can't get that much for it. Okay well I'll go tr I'll go try Polo. Like and like I can't get this amount of money. What yeah. the price is supposed to be anywhere? Like oh if I'm I can like because South Korea was just so far inflated and so it was the right move to remove them because it was not an accurate representation of the actual value. So the, And the arbitrage players couldn't make that know, value stabilize? So you, okay, so here's the thing is I know people in Silicon Valley that were flying to South Korea to liquidate their assets because they had enough where that three thousand dollar flight was, was very much worth it. And yeah. that was interesting. That was what they were doing. Wow. Um, and <laughs> that's ridiculous. I think that's not real life. That's the most in the world. And how long did that period last? Uh, a little while, days. yeah. Days and weeks. Yeah, it was, a, it was at least a week. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I remember telling Jonathan about it at work and say, "Look at this, look at this price." I mean, our our exchanges are going to meet this price, and <coughs> lo and behold, a day or two after, it was hitting the Korean prices. The, mm -hmm. and then they took it off, and it was like, "Oh God, yeah. what's going so on?" That, that's the Rothschild <laughs> story, right? Yeah. Everybody yeah, tell us that from the Waterloo. Uh, battle that Rothschild knew the outcome of the Waterloo battle before anybody else, and so they dumped, they dumped, and then they pumped. They bought it all, and then it pumped when yeah, they got the result of the war. Yeah, or the, you know, the result. Yeah, but they had to spend a lot of money on those carrier pigeons. Don't forget. <laughs> well, yeah. was, apparently they were getting. Oh, was it carrier? Yeah, yeah. they had carrier know. pigeons on the on the battlefield that were flying back to uh, to London <laughs> with messages. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta build for the carrier pigeons. So yeah. So it's centralized. More or less, what we were saying is, is as much as we're trying to decentralize the currency and the consensus and all that, we we've really got a centralized so way for. We're gonna decent. Yeah, and I, I really believe 2018 is the year of decentralization for exchange. I mean, we see the platforms looming and it's happening. Um, I'm not so sure about that though. You don't think so? No, because as a human being, I can only keep track of so many things in my mind at one point, and if I have to keep track of more than five exchanges, I immediately start tuning them out, and so I naturally, you know, move towards the convergence of a single thing, and so we want to eventually these all these exchanges where you can have one person come on and say, well, here's the averages of all the exchanges, and so they've centralized all that data. Yeah, this is interesting, and I this is the first time this occurred to me was a couple months ago when Jeff and Krista presented up here and talked about their trading, and Krista was like talking about how important customer service for an exchange was, mm -hmm. and it occurred to me the value of that with if you're decentralized, you have no recourse. There's no customer service. You right. it's all on you. 
which is idealistic and the you know it does represent the ideals of what we want in this but that's not really, is that really what we want well, is it really what we want right now yeah. right. finance is working on creating a decentralized exchange that's basically just a network of smart contracts for people to buy and sell yeah, right that's the and they will have still their customer support if people need help that resource will be there available to them and the BNB token is what will be the underlying fuel of that network but you know that that's another step towards the decentralization and uh, avoiding regulatory uh, blocks that might be in, in their path because there will no longer be a central server in Hong Kong that you can just go and shut down right. because it's just a system. You literally have to shut down individual access. You have to shut down the grid. Yeah, you have to shut down the internet to close off that smart contract lattice. Maybe like that, you have to shut down the, the electricity or right. anything because you still have peer to peer. And even well, then, as soon as the power turns bad, but you could turn off regions. So I mean, you could. Yeah. Well, I mean, but that wouldn't matter because it's decentralized, so you would just yeah. deal with the network compute on a different area. Yeah, for decentralized, aren't we, aren't we lulling ourselves into a bit of passivity here? I mean, KYC and AML is going to happen to decentralized exchanges just like it is to a centralized exchange. They're just going to find a proxy smart contract way to verify your identity before you're allowed to use it. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. The, it the harder to. you make it, right? The it more, the, you know, the more power that an individual takes is the more power that the, the uh, the more power that people take back, like the, the harder you make it to fight against, you're at least creating leverage. Whether you win or not, the more leverage you create, you're at least advancing your position to negotiate a better outcome, right? I mean, totally. Just, uh, I mean, there will always be, I mean, look, if you want to move to Equatorial Guinea, I promise you could be more free there than anywhere else in the world, right? Yeah. No one's going to tell you. But you're not going to want to live there, right? You're probably not gonna KYC live there. is important, though, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, it, the fact that you can make, you can ensure people not to monitor, launder money or you can ensure that people are not funding things that they shouldn't be able to. I mean, I think having your identity being verified is one thing as long as you're the person who is in control of when that verification happens. Right. So, you know. I think the argument boils down similar to like the ICO discussion with like the mailing address and the, the suitability. It, it's, it's similar to like Napster versus BitTorrent, right? One of them was very seizable one of them was very unseizable. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, the, the, so, so the decentralized uh, hydra ability of some of these uh, subsystems uh, really yeah. shows its uh, benefits in those cases. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I, I try to, um, when trying to deal with like complex systems, I try to break things down into kind of simple analogies. And so I try to think of the fetch line. The pendulum can only swing so far one way and it can only swing so far the other way. So I look at those as the absolute boundary conditions for anything. And so I say, okay, what's the absolute boundary condition? On one side is full decentralization, full anonymity, full everything. And then the other side is full centralization, no anonymity. So what what I think we're striving for is as close, you know, we want to we want to start, we were kind of over here, and now we want to start swinging that pendulum over here. And I would argue that we as human beings, we don't generally function well at the extremes. Yeah. We always try to find some place in the middle, and maybe through politics and through like what, what goes on in everyday life in America versus Venezuela versus Eastern, you know, you know uh, Guinea, um, we decide where in that, where, where our society feels most comfortable, and we try to strive to stay there. We want to be comfortable as humans. So, I see wh which way do we want to go towards, and I think decentralization, we want to go there, but I, I just don't know that we can really live at that boundary of full decentralization because of, of all the other perils that kind of it's occur. Too much work. That's why we're building AI and smart really contracts is. to do it for us so that we don't have to worry about it. Well, then yeah, the machines are in charge. Them. Or the people who are programming. Well, that's okay. AI. Machines are not biased. I mean, as long, or they're more bacterial they're cells less biased in your body than there are human cells in your body. You could argue that you are simply a host for the bacteria. It's similar with machines. I mean, look how many computers and smartphones we have. You know, you could argue that humans are merely building out the machine's network already. You know, I, yeah. I mean, where you draw the line in the sand as to when AI has taken over is, is completely a matter of arbitrary opinion for the most part. True. Because as soon as you figure out that you complicated the calculus of the pendulum, somebody's going to make a bigger pendulum. 
and then suddenly it's going to swing further than you. <laughs> I like it. I like that. A, a, wild, a wild ride at six miles. Some that are upside down. Yeah. Like Trump, for instance, being the next extension of that wider pendulum, yeah. took people who are already at one extreme and was like, hey, you want a new level of extreme? We got you. And well, I would argue we're still like, we were still sort of at the middle and fighting yeah. over the middle, <clears throat> largely in America. Compared, yeah, compared to others. And we're swinging in yeah. a certain direction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I but I mean, does it, I mean, I, you know, I guess, what do you guys think of, I mean, is that something that helps or or you, like you, you have to have the um, you have you have to have those sides of pendulum. When, you know, with that, with, I, I don't know that decentralization will work per se, but without decentralization on exchanges, then the centralized exchanges would become too powerful. Knowing that the threat looms, they're there's they're held in place <laughs> to a point. Um, so you know, I, I think it's important to you know maintain you know validity on both sides of that pendulum swing to make sure that each stay accountable. But I mean, couldn't more centralized exchanges <coughs> pop up and then effectively it still gives that pressure? If, if they could demand. potentially provide better service, that's why yeah, I really and like then it makes it a more of a competitive market, market, right? Yeah, yep. and, and applying it to the music industry, right? The decentralization um, that was pushed to the record companies, right? And then whereas it pushed back, the pendulum now swung back to like the Spotify's how many of us are paying for our music again? Right? Mm -hmm. All of us, I would assume. In the pendulum swings back, we see this with TV and media. I'm in TV and media, and I, I see this swing right back. People sit back control with Hulu and Netflix, but the networks figure out a way. Yeah. And you know, in the and coming co-opted both of those platforms. Well, the networks on Hulu, so it's like it's, it's going to be right back. We're going to end up paying sixty, seventy dollars a month for cable we don't want. It's just going to be streaming now. And, <laughs> Bundled streaming package. Get Netflix, Hulu. And even in the interim with net neutrality, I mean, they can still do it because you know, Comcast owns the copper. And well, yeah, but with the way the pendulum swing, though, is the content providers are starting to manufacture their own content. So they're less dependent on the media networks. Yeah, it, it really, the, the, we'll go off topic for two seconds, but the power has to lie in the content creators that keep making great content and you know individuals community has to empower content creators to create better and better content so that it's not only the content creators that are funded by big networks are the only ones that can make the content we have to enable you know this would be a really great application for crowdfunded content creation right but they're really using tokenize the next uh, season of game of thrones exactly yeah, yeah. Boom. <laughs> it's, it's brought into the base of, of content producers <laughs> as well i mean if, if you want a quick laugh you know you don't turn on america's funniest home videos anymore you just go to youtube and look up vines and shit but, it's, it's but ultimately you're right things ultimately eventually consolidate yeah and you still want the production value of game of thrones ultimately and that's what you're willing to pay for right so you still want the access to the YouTube, and that's what you're willing to just go look at. Right. And that's, that's the real problem. Content content you can stop it from it. Yeah. Um, some of if you're on ads against you or something. But, but yeah, use the American Funniest Home Videos. Yeah. Like, if the next alternative to YouTube comes out, YouTube could go away. Like, there's something else that's entertaining us better, right? I don't know. Uh, like, then cats <laughs> typing on keyboards, right? I don't know. They just might self-censor themselves away. It's the, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the content creation business, although a great business, is always riskier than the network access business because the network access business exists. You collect your fifty dollars a month, yeah, and small small. you get people to, to pay you to go onto that network. Yes, the Netflix of the world have changed that dynamic, but Comcast still has um, a, a lot of power. Maybe less and less, but uh, you know that debate's been going on since. You know, Disney didn't own the cable networks; they owned the content, and then they realized they were losing. Uh, you, you know, they were losing leverage. It should be the affiliate network yeah. to the syndicate local right. um, television. I mean, a good example. Out. We're generating content right now that's going to go onto YouTube. So like. So let's use this analogy and apply it to the, the blockchain network and the power the miners have, and then the off-chain, how that's syndicated. Like, I see those analogies kind of come into play. Like, the, those models are what we're kind of building right now. I mean, the miners have a lot, of a lot of power, I would argue, at least on the Bitcoin, for sure on the Bitcoin network. 
Um, so isn't that the, that's the that's the network providers, the Comcast who are yeah. taking a perceived small toll to maintain the infrastructure for us to transact, but they're the big winners in this whole thing, and they they win whether the market goes up or down, or you know. Oh, that's do, why all they have to do is make sure that you use it. Dying to to uh, merge with AT and T, because AT and T presumably has the network, and Time Warner still has oh, content. You know, HBO still has a valued monthly subscription business. And without that, they feel networks, Netflix is just going to roll right over there. Yeah. Amazon can, and they might be right. Yeah. Right. So, like, how do we apply that to? Yeah. How do we apply those well, lessons to the what we're building? going to happen is that um, data providers are going to become utilities, and the held the sanctions of, you know, what things that a electric company would be. You know, data is becoming central to our economy, central to our being. So, if you're going to provide data as a service, you become a utility. But are you going to regulate it like a utility? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what that and those is. Those utilities are regulated. They're called common carriage. Well, exactly. Right. They would be, yeah. what is it, uh, Section yeah. 9. Yes, but you can also nine. sell your energy back to the utility. So if you're a good content creator and there are tokens that are created for that creativity, you're going to get paid on it. Yeah, but the regulatory authority controls the amount of profit those providers make. Is that what we're, that's what we want? I don't that's know if it's what utility we commission. want, but I think it's probably what we need. We're we're, we're incredibly dependent on data, right? Like we have to have it to function. And the free like market can't supply us data. If, so free, if, the, if the free market fails us, which they are, if they do not support net neutrality, you know, you know, the yeah, content yeah. creators are also the ones providing you the data. They're failing us now. It has to the government has to step in and make it a utility. Well, and then you could just all, as well same. argue, you know, take it to the next step. I mean, you know, we're paying, you know, Comcast for example. <laughs> And I think P.J. O'Rourke said it best, you know, when buying and selling are controlled by legislation, the first things to be bought and sold are legislators. Uh, <laughs> so you're not really solving the problem, you're just building it one layer up. Right. And, and, and not only, I mean, Comcast, yeah, Comcast can send me a $50 bill in the mail. Comcast can't show up at my house with a gun and put me in jail, whereas politicians can. Right, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's, not, it's just not gonna make sense anymore. They're, they're all racing to the bottom. And, that won't work for very much longer. Where you have to compete, compete, compete to the point where, you know, how do we make money now as these providers? And it gets shittier and shittier. Well, of course, that's where long innovation is driven sure. by that competition. Well, I mean, look at uh, textiles from Great Britain compared to India. But if Great Britain yeah. adopted the loom, and the Luddites, you know, wanted to to stop the adoption of that. Uh, but the loom was still adopted, and textile industry in, in the UK boomed, whereas in India, it was protected by law. You know, we need to protect this industry, protect these jobs. Like we're going to have yeah. these people weaving by hand. We're not going to allow looms. And India is still, uh, pardon the expression, in, in some of these regards, a poor shithole of, of an area when it's these people manufacturing textiles by hand when they could be adding so much more value uh, to their village. I mean, it, it's the same thing as you know hiring somebody uh, to dig a ditch with a backhoe versus hiring 20,000 people to dig a ditch with a spoon. You know, yeah, you're creating more jobs, but you're not creating more value. You're making it worse off than if the other 19,000 plus could be employed yeah, doing the other tasks. The reason why this ultimately probably needs to be utility is because the barrier to entry is so high to, to compete. You know, you have to, you know, there's wireless spectrum for sale with the FCC, and um, there's been huge purchases there, but by well, obviously huge companies that have the $6 well, why billion are you not allowed spend. to use that? It's because of the government regulation in place that the barrier to entry is so right. high. Right, so you've already centrally for a number of years, and they specifically lobbied for more regulation because they had the revenue base to be able to comply with that, knowing that smaller Nobody competitors does, right. would never be able but to get up to that point. Because they will ultimately have to become a utility because of that, right? They are a utility. They are they a utility. Work. But they'll start to sanction <laughs> like one, right? They, they are, are a utility. utility. Here's, where, here's where that ultimately breaks down, is the idea of new technologies and replacements. Essentially, so for really any incumbent data provider, uh, their core issue has nothing to do with uh, existing data models or data delivery, and everything to do with spectrum, or different ways of delivering data. So if you look at it, your landline was a regulated, basically, form of technology uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, delivery well, to get the investment originally for the service to be yeah. deployed. Massive in infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, but your mobile phone is not. It is not regulated in any way, shape, or form. 
Uh, and if you look what happens, price competition is going down. The technology has skyrocketed. Uh, your mobile phone is now more valuable and more useful to you than a landline ever could be, than a phone ever could be. What we see in our direct level competition has more to do with next gen and how people are delivering speeds faster that are three or four generations ahead of uh, uh, cable on the ground. Uh, and it can be anything from bandwidth to 5G to basically a Elon Musk satellite in the air. But at some point, you're going to be able to compress enough data uh, to deliver via an unregulated system. So it's sort of competition has sort of stemmed uh, huge amounts of innovation, uh, where in a regulated space that will never happen. Well, is the mobile is the mobile space really that deregulated? Because there's all kinds of fees that I'm paying for on my on my bill that mm -hmm. are I thought forms of regulation and set by the. They're, they're not like AT&T setting my public access fee and my 911 fee and my all those. AT&T still has to pay those taxes. Uh, so, but in terms of the actual service delivery, uh, is entirely up to AT&T. Oh, okay. right. All right. So, but aside from that piece, but as much as I want to keep having this conversation, we should transition because we are way on topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got like 15 minutes left. I feel like I crashed oh, to the ground from our utopia, though. We talked about yeah, we're fell into regulation. Yeah. Oh my God. So I don't remember what the next it's, one is. We're not the first technology to build bus.